This is the first lecture on John Perry's A Dialogue on Personal Identity and Immortality. The basic setup of the book is this. Gretchen Weirob, a philosophy professor, has been in a very tragic accident. And although her brain is fine and her mind is clear, her body is very unlikely to last more than a couple of days. And so Gretchen brings in a couple of friends. There's Sam, Sam Miller, a chaplain, and Dave Cohen, a former student. And she asks Sam and Dave to convince her that her identity can survive bodily death because currently she identifies personally, herself, with her physical body, which is very likely to die in the next few days, and so she's very upset about this. She can still reason quite well, and she doesn't get too emotional, as you'll see in the book. But in any case, she's distressed by this, and she wants Sam and Dave to convince her that she'll survive, or her identity will survive. And she says very early on that if they give her some sort of an Eastern philosophical argument that she will somehow join with the universe and the, the Great One, that's not going to be of any help whatsoever. Gretchen wants Gretchen to survive, not rejoin with the universe. She also clarifies that while if she had more time, maybe she could distinguish between mind and soul and identity. For the purposes of their current conversation, mind, soul, and identity are the same thing. Now, when she speaks of her own identity, she says that there are at least two components. One is forward-looking and one is backward-looking. A person has an identity, or we're referring to that, that identity, if they have a particular set of memories. And those, those memories need to have been properly acquired. And by properly acquired, Gretchen explains that those memories have to be the result of the person actually experiencing those things they have in their memory. So if I were to be hypnotized into thinking that I had uh, won a NASCAR race, that wouldn't be a genuine part of my identity because I didn't actually win a NASCAR race. And it wouldn't be a genuine memory, but an implanted memory. And so that'll become important in a moment when uh, Sam and Dave try to console Gretchen in several different ways. But in any case, it has to be a properly acquired memory. The other aspect, the forward-looking aspect of identity that, that Gretchen clarifies is that you need to be able to, and you must, have a certain sort of anticipation. So if I'm worried about something that's going to come up next week, actually next week my five-year-old son is going to begin kindergarten. And I'm very worried about that because he's been sheltered for five years and I'm not ready for him to go into the school system and have other kids and other people influence him in the way they're going to. And I know I hated kindergarten. I used to go in the bathroom and cry. And I don't want him to have to do that. So I'm worried about that. That's something that is integral to my identity and it indicates that Matt indeed has an identity and it's an aspect of my identity because I have that sort of anticipation, that sort of worry. I also have positive anticip anticipation because college football is going to start up in just a few weeks. I'm a big UT Vols fan, and I'm, I'm ready to go to some games and, and see the Vols hopefully beat Florida or Alabama or Georgia or South Carolina or at least one of those teams this year. And so that's the other aspect of identity that Gretchen explains. You've got to have properly acquired memories that you actually gain. They're not the result of hypnotism or just a, uh, a poor memory. And you also have to anticipate events in the future. So I'm not going to anticipate the events that you are going to experience in the future, and you're not going to anticipate the events I'm going to experience in the future. So that indicates we have separate identities. All right. So the group considers something called Cartesian dualism. Cartesian just refers to Rene Descartes, and he was a French philosopher. And he popularized the view that our mind, and in this case, for the purposes of the conversation, the same thing as our soul, is our consciousness and uh, our identity, is distinct and separate from our body. It's made up of a different sort of substance. And so we have a physical body and an immaterial, non-physical mind. And so the dualism just means you've got those two or different substances or the dual substances. And so the group entertains Cartesian dualism as a potential way for Gretchen's identity to survive bodily death. 
Gretchen doesn't seem to take that possibility too seriously this early in the book. And the conversation diverges um, a little bit. And she clarifies that, um, or in fact, Sam clarifies what Descartes means about Cartesian dualism. He says, quote, your mind or soul is immaterial, lodged in your body while you're on earth. The two are intimately related, but not identical. That's from page seven. So Gretchen and Sam consider the importance of continuity as well. They talk about how a river can be the same river, even when it has different water molecules, and even when it stretches for hundreds of miles, so long as the river doesn't break and it has uh, just a, a continuous flow. And they use that as a sort of illustrative analogy to help explain the importance of experience continuity, because it's, it's either Sam or Dave who proposes to Gretchen, well, Gretchen, what if after you die in heaven, there's another body waiting for you. And in that body, God is going to implant the memories that you've had here on earth. Wouldn't that be a way for your identity to survive bodily death? And of course, if you listen to what I said just a second ago, you'll immediately see that that would not be reassuring for Gretchen because that body in heaven, while it may have her memories, would not be her. Her physical body is the one that had those different experiences that was a philosophy professor and, and uh, cried in the bathroom in kindergarten. So that wouldn't, that wouldn't give her any, any, uh, any consolation or any help. They, uh, they close out their meeting with uh, a bit of a joke. Um, and here's some discussion questions for you to consider. And so um, Sam says on page four that he thinks it would be inexcusable for a God to create us and not provide us with an afterlife. He says, quote, I don't know why he would have created us if these few short years of toil and torment are the end of it. And so there's two questions from that. Uh, the first question is, is that a fair description of life? A few short years of toil and torment. I hope not. I hope your life's going a little bit better than that. And if it's not, a, it'll definitely change. You can't continue on like that forever. And the second question is, regardless of what we think about this life, whether it is, in fact, just a matter of toil and torment, or if it's much better, is it necessary that a, a good God would have to give us an afterlife? Is that something that would be morally required of a God that came and created the universe and created us, would he, she, or it owe us an afterlife? Or is it completely consistent for God to create us in the universe and not give us an afterlife? It's the first question to consider. Second question is, at the end of the chapter, Sam quotes Emerson in saying, quote, a little philosophy turns one away from religion, but that deeper understanding brings one back. So, that means a little bit of philosophy makes you less religious, makes you question your faith. But the deeper you go into philosophy, oftentimes the more religious you become and the stronger your beliefs become. And so Gretchen replies with a joke that her ex-husband used to say that a little philosophy turns one away from religion and more philosophy makes one a pain in the neck. So, um, and that's from page 18. And so the question here is what do you think about this, this first chapter? This is... The very first thing I'm having you read in this class is, is quite possibly the first philosophy course you've ever taken. Uh, we've, we've asked some very uh, potentially unnerving questions about what is an identity, uh, uh, provided some candidate explanations, some candidate definitions, some candidate features of what identity is. You've probably thought a couple of times during this talk that why in the world are we thinking about this? And I don't know what identity is and why does it have to have the future orientation and the past orientation and the anticipation and the memories. You probably, probably never thought about that question in that much detail. Maybe you've thought about Cartesian dualism. Perhaps you've taken that for granted in the past. But in any case, we're talking about some things that potentially could be unnerving. What do you think about the quote there at the end that a little bit of philosophy is likely to make one less religious, but a lot is likely to make a person either much more religious or have stronger faith or to become a pain in the neck. So 
post your uh, replies as you can. Video replies are much preferred. I'd like to get to know you in that way, but written replies are also acceptable. Thanks so much for uh, listening and your efforts in this regard.